Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And today we're taking a look at a new 2025 study which explored a question that's both practical and relevant for anybody who trains seriously. And that is how close to failure should you train to maximize muscle size and strength gains? The authors compared two training strategies, one where every set was taken close to failure and another where participants began farther from failure and gradually pushed closer and closer over time. Now they also looked at whether lifters got better at estimating their repetitions in reserve or their RIR after 10 weeks of practicing this approach. So let's get into some background. Resistance training stimulates muscle growth mainly through mechanical tension and the recruitment of high threshold motor units. But a key question in programming still remains, and that is do you need to push every set to complete failure, or can you make similar progress by stopping slightly shy of failure? Previous research cited by this group of authors suggests that training close to, but not necessarily at failure, can lead to similar hypertrophy outcomes. However, the exact proximity that minimizes adaptations while managing fatigue isn't fully clear in trained individuals. So to investigate this question, Vieira and colleagues compared two 10-week training programs, one where participants maintained roughly one rep in reserve on every set throughout the 10 weeks, while the other group started four reps away from failure and gradually reduced that gap each week until they reached an RIR of one. The researchers also measured how accurately participants could estimate their proximity to failure both before and after the study. So let's take a look at the methods. This study included 39 resistance trained adults aged between 20 and 35, and they were randomized into those two groups. Group one trained with about one rep in the tank on every set, while group two started each training block at four reps in reserve and progressively decreased to an RIR of one by the fourth week of the program. Participants trained for 10 weeks following a four day per week upper lower body split. Each five week block included a deload in the fifth week where training frequency and volume were reduced, but all the sets were still performed to an RIR of one. So as you can see in the table that I'm sharing on the screen, the first block used three sets of seven to nine reps, whereas the second block used four sets of four to six reps per exercise. Based on the program design, the weekly set volume ranged from about eight to 14 sets per major muscle group. Training was partly supervised where participants completed some of the sessions in person under research supervision, especially at the start of each training block to verify their proper technique and effort, while the rest of the sessions were completed independently in their own gyms, but the participants had to do the following. They had to log every workout, including their load and RIR using an online tracker provided to them submit video recordings of selected sets throughout the study for researchers to review, and lastly, check in with the research staff to confirm adherence and make load adjustments where necessary. This system helped maintain program consistency while mimicking a real world training condition. Muscle growth was measured with B mode ultrasound, assessing the vastus lateralis cross sectional area and the triceps brachii muscle thickness. Maximal strength was also measured with a one rep max in both the back squat and the bench press. To test RIR estimation accuracy, participants performed a standardized test both before and after the 10 week training program. In these tests, the participants performed sets of squat and bench press at 80% of their one rep max and were asked to verbally indicate when they believed they had three reps remaining and again when they believed they had one rep remaining. The actual number of reps completed after each cue was recorded to determine the difference between their perceived and true proximity to failure. Now before we dive into the results, if you're looking for a new training program then head over to my website and check out my workout library. You'll find hundreds of programs for all experience levels and goals, whether you train at home or in the gym. From mobility and warm-ups to cardio and full body training plans, everything is designed to help you reach your goals. And with programs starting at just $12.99, you really can't go wrong. To get your next evidence-based training program, make sure you head on over to my website, viabody.com. All right, let's get back into the results. So what did the authors find? 31 of 39 participants completed the program with 15 in the RIR1 condition and 16 in the RIR1 to 4 condition. Adherence was high with over 90% of the prescribed sessions completed. Both groups improved strength and muscle size, yet there were no significant group by time interactions for any of the main study outcomes. Basically, this means that the changes were statistically similar between both groups. For strength, squat 
one rep max increase by about 9.2% in the RIR1 condition and 9.8% in the RIR1 to 4 group condition. Bench press one rep max increased by roughly 9.6% in the RIR1 group and 7% in the RIR1 to 4 group. Even though these differences weren't statistically significant, the authors noted interesting individual patterns. In the RIR 1 to 4 group, all 16 participants improved their squat 1 rep max, and 13 of them increased by more than 5 kilograms. Conversely, in the RIR 1 group, improvements were a little more variable. Only five of the 15 participants improved by that same amount. Now, when it comes to hypertrophy, the vastus lateralis cross-sectional area increased by about 5.5% in the RIR 1 group and 6.5% in the RIR 1 to 4 group. Tricep thickness increased by 5.8% in the RIR 1 to 4 group and 2.2% in the RI1 condition. Again, there were no statistically significant group differences, but both both programs appeared to increase muscle size and strength. The average session RPE was lower in the RIR 1 to 4 group, around 6.9, compared to 7.7 .7 in the constant near failure group, suggesting that progressively reducing your RIR made the sessions feel easier while still producing comparable results. Now, when it came to RIR estimation accuracy, both groups were reasonably accurate at baseline, but the RIR 1 to 4 group improved further after training. Their estimated RIRs during the 80% one rep max testing were a closer match to their actual proximity to failure by the end of the study, indicating that structured RIR-based training might actually enhance one's ability to judge effort accurately. Overall, both training strategies produced similar improvements in muscle size and maximal strength. The progressive RIR approach didn't lead to greater training adaptations, but it did allow participants to train with slightly lower perceived effort while still achieving comparable results. However, it's important to recognize the limitations that might help to explain why no differences were detected. Firstly, this was a relatively small sample with only 31 participants completing the study, which limits the statistical power to detect subtle differences between groups. Second, there was also no non-exercise control group, meaning it's not possible to separate training-induced growth from normal biological variation or even measurement error. In addition, the practical differences between the two training programs was only quite small. The progressive group only spent one week during each training block, training at an RIR of four before closing that gap towards failure each subsequent week. Given this small exposure window and considering both groups trained at high efforts for most of the sessions, it's plausible that the study was never going to detect a difference between these two conditions. After all, most research suggests that training needs to be taken to or near to failure to maximize muscle growth, something both groups were essentially doing for the entirety of the 10-week training program. So while the findings suggest similar adaptations between the two approaches, it's fair to say that this study may never have been positioned to reveal a meaningful difference in the first place. So what does this mean for you and I? Well, after 10 weeks of resistance training, consistently training very close to failure with an RIR of one and gradually progressing towards failure with an RIR of one to four, both produced similar gains in strength and muscle size in resistance trained lifters. Perhaps the most interesting finding from this study was that the progressive approach led to lower perceived exertion and what the authors considered as resulting in more consistent improvements across individuals. This goes without saying, training with RIR targets also help participants become better at estimating their proximity to failure, supporting the idea that RIR is a valuable tool for autoregulation in strength training programs. That said, with the small sample size, short exposures to higher RIRs or lower effort sets, and the overall similarity between the two interventions, future studies using longer durations, more distinct differences in proximity to failure, for example, comparing an RIR of six with an RIR RIR of one and larger sample sizes will be needed to confirm whether meaningful differences in size and strength truly exist. If you found this video helpful, make sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel for more science-based nutrition and training breakdowns every week. And let me know in the comments, do you usually train to failure or do you leave a few reps in the tank? And how accurate do you think you are at predicting your RIR? Thank you so much for watching guys and I'll see you in my next video.